welcome to Legally Speaking with me, Tarun Nandia. Today we discuss an important judgment delivered by Justice Sachin Datta on the Contract Act, where he lays down the fact that absence of a contract would not deprive the party from a reasonable remuneration for the work performed. Now we will discuss this principle today, and this for uh, uh, the viewers would want to know. This is BSNL versus Vihar Networks. That is the judgment. You can of course go and read it. But of course, we're going to discuss this in detail today. And let me introduce to you my panel today. Uh, I have with me eminent senior uh, advocate, Mr. Sanjay Jain. As we all know, he has served as the additional Solicitor General of India for a long period of nine years. And uh, now is also back to private practice. He will discuss his judgment in detail. Good to see you again. And uh, looking forward to some interesting insights. Uh, we you. also... Thank you. We also have with us uh, senior advocate uh, Sridhar Potaraju. I am happy to host him again for the first time after he got his gown. And uh, many, many congratulations to you. Uh, uh, you. It's, a, it's, it's a big achievement and uh, it is something that should be cherished and something to be proud of. Uh, we really happy at Legally Speaking uh, to welcome you in your new avatar. Thank and you. uh, and uh, at the outset, uh, May I request uh, Senior Advocate uh, Sanjay Jain uh, to give the opening comment and then we move on with the discussion. Over to you, Mr. Jain. Uh, Tarun, in my view, this uh, judgment uh, rendered by Justice Sachin Datta serves as a powerful reminder that all parties involved in a contractual uh, ecosystem or a contractual relationship must operate with the principles of fairness and equity. Even in the absence of a final or a formal contract to that effect. And that is the, the basic principle is uh, Section 70 of Contract Act, which says basically and uh, very prominently that if the other party knows that the work performed by the opposite party is not complementary and it is not intended to be complementary and that the other party is expecting to be compensated, then merely because you have not formalized uh, your terms and conditions uh, within the ecosystem of the contract, then you will deprive the other party uh, from the remuneration is something which is unethical and uh, it is also illegal in terms, in terms of Section 70 of the Contract Act. It is this broad principle that Justice Datta's judgment clarifies and amplifies in this uh, very important judgment, which he has rendered in the context of Section 34. Another aspect which I need to point out, which is very important from this judgment's point of view, that Justice Datta has delivered this judgment totally within the four corners of Section 34 of the Arbitration Act. He has been very careful in observing that what all is permissible under Section 34. And within that boundary, he has rendered this judgment. And he says very categorically that in this scenario, where it was clear to the other side as to what it wanted to be done. So therefore, BSNL cannot say that merely because the terms and conditions were not reduced into writing for that particular work, which was done at the behest of. Because what is important is that suppose a contractor does something on its own without being told or which is not expected of him or which is not at the behest of the other side or which is not something which is otherwise required because he has to, the, the fundamental point which the judgment acknowledges is that the contractor has worked in good faith. So long as he is able to establish that he has worked in good faith and it was expected of him then and he has delivered. So tomorrow the, the employer cannot turn around and say that no, no, thank you very much. We will not pay you because there is no written contract to that effect. So this is, this is, this will be unethical commercial practice and this should not find any place in the realm of uh, contractual world between uh, two contracting parties who are otherwise engaged in a contract because it is not that somebody from the road suddenly came and worked for you 
this scenario arises only when the two parties are already engaged uh, in a commercial uh, relationship and there the situation arises that they do something and if somebody does something then that person has to be compensated and this this will uh, this will clarify and dispel the doubts of uh, many people who who believe or who end up advising the lawyers and end up advising their clients that oh no you need not pay because uh, you have not agreed for it or that there is no written contract or there is no uh, there is no understanding which was reduced into writing so you can avoid paying so this this uh, this uh, advice would fall in the uh, on the wrong side of the uh, legal principles which have now been completely reinstated for all times to come by this delhi high court judgment of justice datta which honors and respects this uh, doctrine of uh, uh, you know uh, quantum uh, merit uh, and quantum merit is is a aged uh, tested time tested principle which uh, basically promotes uh, equity and fairness in the uh, in the bargain so that is my uh, opening uh, comment on this uh, judgment sir uh, thank you thank you mr jain for that opening comment we got senior advocate uh, shridhar kotaraju for his opening comment on uh, this judgment and the contract act and the principle section 70 has three ingredients uh, which need to be uh, established before uh, the jurisdiction of the court could be invoked for a claim under section 70 and the honorable justice datta has beautifully carved out the scope of section 70 in his erudite judgment while exercising a very limited jurisdiction of section 34 under the arbitration and conciliation act to me the three things which needs to be established by a claimant when he is asserting a claim under section 70 are that there should be something which is done lawfully for another person or deliver something to him lawfully two should not intend to act gratuitously so it should not be a charitable or a, a, a thing of that nature and thirdly and most important thing which should actually be the crucial test is the person who is the recipient of the service or the works should have a freedom to either accept it or reject it and then he chooses consciously to accept the goods or the works delivered now in a given case when a person without any formal contract that is when section 70 is attracted so therefore there are situations where a person in a regular contractual relationship has been directed by the employer as in the present case where a advance purchase order was given and that was accepted within 15 days and about a year and a half later the follow up purchase order is not given and in fact it is terminated so whatever actions or the acts have been undertaken by the contractor in this case were squarely covered under the uh, realm of section 70 because they reason no of concluded contract in the eyes of law and that is how the applicant under section 34 sought to wriggle out that has been rejected that uh, the defense has been rejected by the learned arbitral tribunal and the challenge there too has also been rightly rejected by justice datta because the pleadings under section 34 or the point which has been formulated on this issue was whether that the impugned award is actually illegal on account of directing a payment to be done for the work carried out by the respondent went to the advance purchase order so that that's the uh, scope of this proceedings where clearly it is outside the purchase order but pursuant to an advance purchase order so it is not really fructified into a contract so whatever was done is what is be subject of uh, this kind of a, a, a query which has been done okay point 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 well taken uh, we now request senior advocate uh, mr sanjay jay if you can delve into the final principles of law of contract and and uh, apply this principle to different kind of mode of work uh, i mean it could be a, a different case where sometimes some work which is not been ordered could have been done you know there could be many contours that a court would need to uh, uh, examine for example we asked for a plus we got a plus 6 well plus 6 wasn't needed but we bill for it there could be various various other modes could you just delve into it 
Yes, first of all, uh, I am visualizing it from the point of view of a common uh, contractor uh, who is a very small time contractor and who is pitted against the might of a government organization where he is likely to be the victim of uh, bureaucratic red tapism. So this judgment comes to the rescue of all those small time contractors who may not be in a position to fight the might of the state where the bureaucratic red tapism you know, shows them the door that look, you, you did it on your own, we didn't ask you, uh, or any kind of uh, uh, false uh, uh, pretext that they can give. So there the contractor can now stand up and say that, look, this was the work which arose in the ordinary course of my execution. And so you can't, you know, uh, put me out on account of technicality, so you please pay. So this, as I said, that this principle is basically to restore equity and fairness in commercial contract. So ordinarily, we, we speak about, uh, we, we think that equity is not part of contract, but then contract, uh, all contract, because they all, they all uh, have to uh, come up to the expectation of public policy. So no public policy will ever perm permit a situation which is lacking in equity. So therefore, this restores that one. Secondly, this also has to come with a caution that a contractor will not be in a position to take advantage of this particular principle in all kinds of situations. First of all, this situation should arise in the in the in the course uh, of work where he is either expected, he can show that yes, he was expected to do it, or he was called upon to do it, or he was placed in a situation that he had to act in good faith for the benefit of the employer, and he did it. For uh, the situation arose in the he did it. So, therefore, that is the kind of uh, situation that is contemplated. But if something which is prohibited by the uh, contract or something which, which the contract very clearly defines, say, for instance, there is a multi-phase contract, phase one, phase two, and phase three. So, if the, if the contract provides that the employer will pay till the phase one is over and the moment you enter into phase two, that particular payment will not be payable. Then something else becomes the uh, the governing uh, part of the governing principle of the contract. Then in that situation, if somebody, some contractor says that work which was uh, relatable to phase one, and he continued to do it in phase two also, even though contract prohibited him or the contract did not enable him to do so, or contract did not visualize him to do so, or call upon him to do so, he on his own, without being called upon, continue to do it. And the employer may be able to say that, look, gentlemen, I didn't ask you to do it. You were doing it at your own peril. For instance, uh, he is doing some exploration work on his own. If he succeeds in exploration, he will in any case uh, get the benefit when the position comes to the development stage. So if some party says, say, for instance, there is a contract which has exploration period, followed by development period, followed by production period, so he, he is supposed to do the exploration and be compensated for exploration till exploration period. And if suppose he on his own continues to do exploration after that, then he cannot bind the, uh, the employer to pay to him for that exploration work done after the exploration period. So this is uh, my view that this, this, this judgment has to be uh, understood with certain caveats. But by and large, it is very good, extremely good judgment for the benefit of the small time contractors and the exploitation at the hands of the mightier party will stop now. One follow up question I want to ask you this judgment by Sachin Datta, do you see this application into a large number of cases involving big private companies and small uh, contractors that may erupt and this judgment will be cited? You see a, a large application? Yes, I, I do see a, a large application of this judgment. I, I do see a large a benefit of this judgment. This judgment will be taken benefit of by large number of people in their day-to-day -day, uh, contractual situations. So in a way, this judgment has a, has a larger ramification from the point of view of the people who work day and day and night in the, in the contracts of a smaller denomination. So it is not only a uh, judgment who benef benefit the the large uh, contractors in a large scenario. It is a uh, it is a very grassroots judgment, which which is predicated on grassroots principles and is intended to benefit the grassroots people as well. Okay, point 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 very well taken. Uh, we go to senior advocate Sridhar Potaraju for uh, 
uh, his comment uh, on the judgment by Justice Sachin Dutta on the contract. See, uh, this judgment actually has now uh, laid down the ground rules insofar as the public sector or the large corporations playing around with the smaller uh, players, the contractors, etc. Now, what happens is more often than not, what we see, the contract has provisions which mandates that the instructions of the engineering in charge or the architect have to be undertaken without demo and the issues can be escalated later. Now, under that good faith, the contractor has to do certain works which are not within the scope of the contract or the notice in writing to tender. Later on, whenever there are disputes, these kind of uh, uh, execution of work, supply of goods are all actually now sought to be put against the contractor and say, we never ordered for it. There's no concluded uh, uh, order, work order for these uh, works. So it is here that Section 70 comes into play to the rescue of a contractor who's definitely not there for any gratuitous uh, service to the uh, larger uh, employer. So, and Justice Datta, by putting it in a perspective, when the tribunal has gone into the evidence as to the nature of work executed, the date on which the advance purchase order was given, the acceptance thereof, and thereafter a purchase order had to follow up and which did not happen. Having regard to the facts and the bona fide execution of work, the preparatory works which were done, which would not have been done otherwise per, per this impression that was given to them, that a purchase order is to follow. The tribunal rightly granted them the amount claimed subject to strict scrutiny of the expenditure incurred, etc. So it did not warrant an interference under Section 34 because this is well within the scope of law, which is uh, the contract act, which governs the parties uh, in question. Point, point very well taken. Uh, we take a final comment from uh, senior advocate uh, Sanjay Jain. Over to you, Mr. Jain. See, uh, in my view, uh, it is very important uh, that uh, uh, on a reasonable frequent uh, basis, if uh, we are blessed with uh, judgments like this, which uh, you know break into uh, the area which is a relatively grey area, and uh, where really required to innovate judicially. So that in that context, I really welcome this judgment because it, though it may sound to be a judgment or an, on a first blush it to be a judgment which has, been, which has been given on its own facts in a mundane kind of a scenario. But if you look at the overall importance of these kind of judgments, particularly in the arbitration regime, it assumes a very different dimension or manifestation because what we are looking in the arbitration regime is this only that the quicker disposal of complex disputes particularly between the contractor and the employer and there usually what happens is that the maximum time is consumed in fighting on issues which are largely technical which are, uh, it's a hair splitting kind of an argument which is taken. And what happens in, uh, what happens is that in the overall scenario, uh, one tends to forget that the time of travel ought to be consumed on the issues which are well structured on legal front or are coming out of facts. Now, therefore, this, this judgment sets uh, at right the gray areas which arise on very technical kind of objections raised by the employer. So I take this judgment in a very positive respect. Uh, symbolically, allegorically, that it will encourage similar kind of uh, approach to be adopted by 34 courts in brushing aside these kind of objections in the name of patent reality, because mostly uh, these, uh, these scenarios arise in the domestic arbitration only. So patent uh, legality as a ground is available. So, so therefore, 
we can find some better examples of uh, patent illegality rather than uh, consuming the valuable time of the terminals and 34 on these kind of issues. That's my take on this. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate uh, that uh, you made time and joined us and discussed the judgment by Sachin Datta. We regularly would like to delve into such kinds of judgments involving the Contract Act. Uh, it makes these issues accessible to a large audience of businessmen who want to be updated on these kind of issues and general counsels who would like to know the fate of such cases. And uh, indeed, I'm thankful that uh, both of you made time. Appreciate your joining us. Thank you. <laughs>